of the Value Exchange podcast. I'm Annabelle Lambert and I am here with my regular co-host uh, Rob Pye. Uh, say hello Rob Pye. Good morning both. Good morning Luke. Good morning Annabelle. Uh, thank you. We are really delighted to be joined today by uh, Lou Perkins who we have only very recently met a few weeks ago um, via the club of doing well and doing good um, so uh, without spending hours telling you things I don't know about Lou I'm going to hand straight over to her and ask her to tell me tell us tell everyone um, sort of about you where did it all start who are you uh, where you come from what you're doing what you're about oh, blimey. just a few yeah. <laughs> light openers there um, <laughs> Where did it all start? Mm. Well, if you go, so the club, of, let's start with the club of doing well and doing good and maybe reverse from there. Um, so this is something that we came to through a wonderful human called Dan Brown, who has had this vision for many years of impacting the lives of a billion people through doing well and doing good. And he established this club and just over a year ago, myself and my brother, Paul Dykes, we got um, introduced to Dan. It's funny how these things happen, isn't it? You just get this introduction. It changes lots of things. And so what Dan was doing is very, very aligned with us, with how we chose to show up and all of those good things. And the, the core value of the club is reciprocity. So it's that give and take, it's that exchange. You have to do well and do good. It's two, they're two sides of the same coin. And so we've been working together on bringing this to life and making it a thing. Um, so that's one aspect of what I do. And I also run a business with Paul, my brother, and that's, um, that's also around uh, helping. I mean, it's all around doing well and doing good, really. But the, the Connect How business is about um, supporting people in businesses, in organisations, and then um, and supporting them how, supporting them what? Well, it's supporting them to reach their full potential, but not in a fluffy way, in a way that's tied to something meaningful that the business is doing. Um, and then I run a podcast with Paul and then I also have a private coaching practice where I have a, a group of absolutely beautiful humans who I coach so and and this what's the golden thread between all of that it's people um I've always been um curious about people what makes us all tick why do we do this not that why do we get stuck getting our own way? Starting with me, because I do it probably, <laughs> well, lots, actually. And um, so that's what the golden thread is, people. How do we um, support each other, you know, and, and, and grow and evolve together? That's kind of, that's what I'm all about, really. And it just finds it's, these, it's a bit like water, you know, when there's a water leak in a pipe and it finds its way through somewhere. Um, it's a bit like that. It's it in my career, in my job working life, it's found its way, even though I used to work in a what didn't look like a peopley space at all. I still it still finds a way. Yeah, and this so look, we'll wind back in just a moment. All the way back, but <laughs> um if we're starting if we're starting at the end, you know, mm. and then maybe jumping back, it, it's yeah, it's, that's cool. But the, the doing well, doing good thing is it's a particularly relevant moment to just unpick that a mm. little bit in terms of um, what Annabelle and I are at the moment saying the I, we component of that. So um, this this uh, could be characterised as individualistic versus collectivist. And mm. so if you're if you're kind of very I, I, I as an organization, mm -hmm. an individual, you know, great for 
your own well-being, for organisations. But the, the we side of that um, is, is quite an interesting sort of yin and yang, a counter to balance to um, take, taking a collectivist view of um, the, the doing well part of it mm. as well as, you know, doing good. Mm. So it, it struck us in what we're doing with this the last project called the Commons Fund, which is essentially about fundraising for projects. And that you could say, well, that's a, that's a doing well. But actually, it could become a very individualistic project, which is mm. it's all about us and the fundraising and a single focus on that. But actually, the, the, the we in that, the collective conversation is, how do we look at everyone that we're working with to support their organizations, their businesses, their missions? And um, it, it struck me that in the agenda of ESG, environmental social mm. governance, or you know, values-based, mission-based organizations, that you could still be very I. And I just wonder what your thoughts are about the how you how you think about the we. Um, it's fascinating. Which is a very complicated question, but it, it's, it is. It, I think it's yeah, let's important. Get, let's get really complicated it. really quickly. <laughs> oh, well, I don't pretend I've got any answers, but I do have a few observations. Yes. Yeah. Because um, you won't ever go up to anyone and say, what do you think? of social value, social impact, ESG, and they go, it's a dreadful idea. I don't know why we put any money into it. No one will ever say that. Because, of course, that's right that we should do these things. But I think what we find is it's very side of desk. It's very... Um, which isn't to say that it isn't given attention. I'm not meaning to imply that people don't take it seriously to a degree but it is something that's kind of over there and we're all over here doing the main stuff that we do as an organization so one of the things that we're talking to some people about is how do we embed it into what you do every day or make the link maybe sometimes you're doing it over here and then you're giving people a few days off and wonderful things in the community here. But actually, in the day to day, there's some social impact and some social value. You're just not seeing it. Great you point. Yeah. You know, Great so point. so let's connect those things together. I think that's happening a fair amount. Um, people don't measure. Well, the other thing we've seen is people don't measure the impact. They measure the input. If that, you know, so they say, well, we we did. Um, 75 of these and 850 of those okay brilliant that's brilliant and what was the impact to people's lives through doing that that's harder to measure of course <laughs> um, but that's where the real value is so but it can it can also be what is the impact that i might count rather than we might count and i, and oh, I think yeah. that Part of this I we debate is taking it into a we we know nothing about a conversation of how this might be an I benefit, but but we are all doing this because this is yeah. really helping a community over here. We we've no it's not philanthropy in that way, but it is actually putting putting a whole community in the centre yeah. of the conversation rather than what what honestly, our organisation might give or take out of that. I think you have to have both. And there has to be a healthy tension between the two and a balance. It can't be all one or all the other um, because then it's off, off, you know, you're off piece then and it's not going to go anywhere. So the organisation, if they're going to put time, money, effort, skills, whatever, into a programme, there has to be a benefit to them, or, you know, as an organisation. However... The, the way that you engage people, hearts, mind, you know, ha head, heart, hands, the way you engage people is to make it real for them. And we, that so the we bit is a very engaging bit and the I bit is a bit more um, 
let's, pa- a piece of paper where you write down the business. Well, yeah, let's pop a nice glossy page in our report yeah. and accounts, which says we're amazing, and I'll tell you for why. So, and, and I'm not saying that's disingenuous. It's not. They've actually done the things, but if you were to talk about that in a more we type of a way, and say, um, you know, this is the connection that we have in these communities it's more than we did 75 hours of whatever we did you know so it's about it's more it's about storytelling not counting i think personally um uh, and it's less tangible and people like a number and a graph and a you know it's so like i say there's this tension between the i and the we between the hard and the soft between the facts and the numbers and the stories and that's right but maybe what we're saying is the balance isn't quite right yet lovely and and I, <clears throat> thank you for that sorry apologies to to you for starting on a hard one it's all right. um you get you gave me the in so let's go right back to birth and talk about how you got here your story just to make yeah. it so what what are the what were the key moments you may recall that might have shaped your story you know the the from the it, mm. it, can be. it well, doesn't have to be childhood but it you know it often is i think uh, well i think that's just the way that it is we get these imprints don't we when we're children um and so my childhood i'm one of four i'm the second of four um children the problem and... second child the problem second child no you see it's <laughs> interesting now because, uh, my sister was a screamer when she was a child and i wasn't so rah my parents were most relieved that i wasn't screaming mary how like she used to um but we're very as a family we're very very close um you know um, my sister's my best friend my parents they're in their 80s now but still my mum is there she was just on the phone this morning saying oh I've got all these people coming over for lunch at the weekend and I'm saying oh could you look after my dog because I'm going away she's like yes fine lovely and so that's very much the vibe um my parents are um Catholic I was brought up as a Catholic I don't practice that religion now as an adult however there's a strong element of service in in built in all of us i can see it you give and serve and that's what you do so that that would be a that thing from my childhood that definitely is is still there and it's there in all of us um and so, you know the closeness of the family um you know i work with my brother you know we so so that that's a very lovely thing which has endured over the years and is is super um what are the key moments i we moved when i was about seven and i hated it and i found that change really hard and i would pretend to be ill and (laughs) i'd say or oh my tummy hurts and they would let me go home because my mum had clearly had a conversation in the background which said, listen, Lou's finding this really tricky. So I remember some of those big changes as being like a real, oh, like a rough landing in an aeroplane or something. How, what, what, and, where did you um, move, Lou? How big was that move? I mean, it seems well, big. It, it was only, we moved from Somerset to um, Berkshire. So it's not like we moved from one country to another. It's just, I found that tricky um my mum is a teacher my dad is he was originally I mean he's an engineer he's a mechanic you know he's very um very very skilled and uh in the Hmm. latter part of his career he was teaching people apprentices and younger people because he worked for this research institute which used to crash cars on purpose repair them and then publish the data um (laughs) and so he he was yeah yeah that's how insurance claims work they use all that data anyway and he would specially he specialized in lorries and hgvs and things and he would teach all these people and so they were both in their own way teaching and then 
Um, my sister has always worked in schools. She works on the pastoral side. And then, you know, one of the big changes for me, I was working in a consulting environment and then um, I chose to shift that to be in learning and development. And so I entered in another learning space, adult learning, and, um, you know, I formalised in a way what I was already doing. So I think that family history of teaching of and of service, those are the two big things that flow through, I think. Um, well, and I can see, you know, rightly or wrongly, I can see the engineering in Paul as well. <laughs> his desire to understand <laughs> how things work you know he very much yeah. uh, I, I mean I met him he, once but as soon as you said that I'm like oh no, yes oh, yeah, works, yeah he's brilliant he he's <laughs> the one doing all the engineering for our podcast he does the sound he does the mixing he does all of it um so um you know I I developed a taste for music as a child I am quite musical, actually, um, but I wouldn't take the time to practice. Of course, we don't like doing that. <laughs> that and so I ended up singing. Yeah. Well, it's boring, isn't it? Me too. And, <laughs> and you know, the violin's a hideous instrument when you're learning. It's not pleasant listening, is it? <laughs> Why do they do that? I did that when I was 10. I don't and know. They go, you can do the violin now. And I was like, it was awful. Absolutely awful. <laughs> oh, no. No, I know. Um, it's not great. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I bounced around a few different musical instruments. But I've got quite a natural aptitude for music and um you know i can read music and all of that business and so i ended up in choirs that's what i used to love because i mean again you can be quite lazy with that can't you and you can just sing anywhere and you don't have to sit down with your music stand in your instrument and so but i loved it that collective singing that was a very beautiful thing and um I'm always singing, much to people's, um, I wouldn't say delight necessarily, but they it's tolerated. <laughs> um, so, yeah, music is a big part for me. And I went to um, music school and, you know, that was on a Saturday. So I did school six days a week, if you think about it. It's crazy. Um, but I, I used to really, really love it. Um, so that, you know, that was a really nice thing for me. Um and uh you know that that back in the day you used to get music lessons at school i don't think you do anymore particularly but um so i had the ability to try lots of instruments out borrow the instruments because we didn't have the funds for me to have private lessons or anything so that was really lovely um although i discovered i was lazy but that's okay and uh yeah so so music is a thing uh, an enduring theme apart from that i had a lovely happy childhood there was there were challenges and issues there always are in any family with any you know um but really um i'm very grateful lots of lots of lovely things yeah and working with your brother um that is yeah. um, that's that's unusual lots of you know there's it's um to to is that is that a, a peaceful arrangement? Is there dynamic tension? Is there, you know, how do it's you manage really, that? I mean, it must yeah. be incredible. I have no no frames of reference where I can sort of unpick that at all. <laughs> My, I, have two, I have two sisters, so I'm one of three, and um, we're just so different that mm -hmm. um, I, I can't imagine having a, a relationship that is a, a work one. How how does it how does it work? It, it obviously does. It does work. Um, we had a conversation, so Paul is the youngest, he's seven years younger than me, but we both kind of are endlessly curious about people. Um, well, we all are really, it just manifests in different ways. And Paul and I, um, we, we had a, a chat on years ago, like, 15 years ago or something, uh, well, we said, oh, wouldn't it be fun if 
at some point we ended up working together. <laughs> and uh, so, and he was doing a corporate job and I was doing a corporate job. And it just, you know, you can't see how that would ever be possible. But then I started working freelance after a few years. And then um, we, we set up a business. And the thing that we did before we set it up was acknowledge what was being put at risk. So our family's very close. If it went south, for whatever reason, that that was at risk. So we're really clear that big things were going um, on on one side of the scale, if you like, and that there was a lot to lose. So what we had to put on the other side was this, and we call it bedrock, this absolute foundation that we have. And I guess it's kind of how our relationship works where we can sometimes we say oh i think we need to have a bedrock conversation about whatever um and it's a place free of judgment of absolute trust where yeah it's like two people holding hands and leaning backwards you can't let go to throw a stone of judgment or to pick up a shield of rebuttal because if you do you'll both fall over so it's this that there is tension um and we are able to easily navigate it because we have the bedrock. And so we mm. work on that bedrock. It's not there by accident. We've put it in place on purpose and we work to keep it, to keep it there, basically. So and if I took you back, I've seen <laughs> on your LinkedIn, you work for oh, yeah. a couple of quite large management consultants and Annabelle yes. and I and co-founder Tony we met in EY it was Ernst nice. and Young I think at, at that at that point so and then you mentioned that there was a transition from um you know being a, I, I often introduce ourselves as or me as a recovering uh management <laughs> recovering. so so what what was the sort of shift in terms of re because you've had quite a few moments in your career of sort of almost reimagining yourself reinventing so yeah. you you went I think from a consultant to then learning and development and what, what yeah. sparked that and what was the journey what was the, well what were the moments it's really interesting because as well as you both know working in a firm like that it's it's a lifestyle choice as much as anything else now I was delighted I traveled all over the world I worked with some incredible people I did some fascinating pieces of work the thing that I always loved was going in and building relationships with your people, the folks on your team, because they weren't necessarily always the same, and with the client. And the faster you can do all of that, the better you can do the actual work. Um, and so I was good at the work, but I was also good at the relationships bit. And I remember before I worked in a firm where they the way they ran their consulting practice was that each individual had a target and you had to go out and meet that target. And the way I chose to do that was by giving bits of projects to other people, effectively giving away some. In a, so, but I built this network and this little, inadvertently, a little team. So they would be like, oh, it's really nice working with Lou and I'm going to do you know, reciprocate and do the same. When I get something that needs two people, I'm going to... So I sort of that. a we, we thing again, back to oh, that I we. Exactly. Yeah. I effortlessly made my target. It was no problem for me because I naturally just done that. And so in the, in in other firms, you know, I, re, I that really cemented to me the importance of, you know, I'm not, it's not an I, it is a we. It always is for me in, in that. It's always a team effort, always, always, always. And so I loved all of that. Um, as a consultant, you were able to get involved with the learning and development. You had to do it at your own um, cost almost because you had to keep going with all your client work as well as try and carve a week out or five, you know, three days or whatever to go and co-deliver this uh, program. Um, so I that that was that was something I chose for myself. So I knew that I was interested in that. And, and that was something. And then the really big thing was I had a child. And when I came back from maternity leave, one of the partners, a female partner, 
took me to one side and said, well, look, um, take take a few weeks to settle back in. But really, you know, you've got to draw some boundaries here that you're comfortable with. I, for example, get try and get home to read the bedtime story, you know, two or three times a week. And, you know, that's my boundary. You've got to know where yours are. And the minute she said that, I thought, well, I know that mine isn't there. And there's no judgment on her for having that boundary. I just know I had this response like that's not what I want. And and so it happened. I was not I just wasn't seeing my child. I just wasn't there, you know. And so I, I was like, no, this isn't this isn't OK. And then the, this secondment opportunity came up. So I I took it. And so it was it was the lifestyle no longer worked for me, basically. And that's so I changed it. And the secondment was into learning and development in yes, KPMG. In manage- that- yeah, in management consulting, yes, yeah. And my, my boss there was incredible. She was so supportive. Because actually, I you know, I've been a consultant for many years. So she knew I could run big projects. I could get things moving. I could do all of that stuff. And she also knew I could deliver because... Um, I could get up on my feet. I'd already proved that through doing, you know, co-delivering some programs. But she invested in me. I got qualified. I got qualified as a coach and as a learning and development person. And it was great, you know. And the thing I loved most was running programs with people, facilitating. I, that was my that was my thing. I absolutely loved it. So it felt like yeah. I'd come home in a funny kind of way. Yeah, yeah, and inter- interesting that um, you know again in terms of what coming out in the conversation, being a mother and lifestyle choices and having a moment, th- these things, you know, you-, you need to tease them out. You know, they're just so important, and yet, yeah. you know, we-, we need to kind of so. So here's a difficult, another difficult question. They're all difficult. Um, <laughs> what would you tell your younger self? So there's so- there's something hiding in plain sight here isn't there that we're all going through these shifts of moving company or you know yeah. being a father a mother or brother or sister mm. I mean you know so if we if we kind of go back to you know that those moments when you were confronted with just tectonic shifts of mm. you know, is this working is it not working what mm. would you tell your younger self I would tell my younger self to go into therapy sooner <laughs> frankly i would uh, tell being me, receiving or giving um receiving, sorry I just... uh, okay. receiving therapy in order that and the reason for that is in order that you can put down actively no notice the things that don't serve you put them down rather than you know going into uh situations of getting a bit you know dinked and doinked and pushed and pulled by things actually um, I would I, I think that that would be the advice I would give because it would put me in the driving seat of my own life sooner. OK, so follow up question. Um, do you think the word therapy has is sort of has a stigma is stigmatized is. And if so, how do we kind of help mm. people listening to the podcast that maybe, you know, that's a good thing rather than. You know, all British people, we don't do that. <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah, yeah, it's true. It does have a stigma. There's no two ways about it. I was talking to a dear friend of mine at the weekend. She is a psychotherapist and I am a coach. And we both have our practices, you know, our private clients, right? And I was saying, oh, you know, this referral and this recommendation she says that doesn't happen to me nobody wants to admit that they're coming to see me (laughs) so it's all a bit behind closed doors so you know maybe there's a sense of um weakness about saying that you need that kind of support for me personally i mean i think mental you know if you think about people in your life who've been who've had mental health challenges we can all think of somebody well, probably, everybody, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Probably Imagine. in your immediate, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so my dad has had mental health challenges for his whole life. 
and I absolutely saw the benefits so I already knew but we don't need to wait until we're in such dire pain to seek some help the way I conceive of it is this if I have something that's not right with my physical body I will go to the doctor and if I have a toothache I will go to the dentist and in the same way that's how I view going to see a therapist it's it's a it's a thing that I think just as humans we need to dip in and out of um the issue with it is you do you do need to pay for it in order to get it in a timely way because of course on the NHS they're overwhelmed and they don't have the capacity however um you know I was fortunate enough to be able to do that um and I think that so so for me it's about putting it on a par with going to the doctor you know it, it's looking off it's just taking care of ourselves in whatever way okay so on the on the I think really important insights wonderful Wonderful, wonderful. And for my children, I've got three boys, wonderful boys. The middle one is um, doing a clinical psychology PhD at the moment. So mental health is his business. You know, it's like that's for the, for the NHS. Um, mm. And I, I just, I, I think that having a reflective conversation about yourself, uh, again, just like going to the gym or going for a walk in the woods, it's all part of well-being isn't it we haven't yet reached that moment where we kind of put it in our daily routine that we've kind of just check in with your yourself kind of thing um, i think and i think we're getting somewhere it's very if i look at how things are now for young people oh, yeah. well just for people now mm -hmm. and the kinds of conversations we're having about mental health and therapy and getting support it's so very different to where it was say 20 years ago mm -hmm so very different massive, massive move and that's, that's, that's got to be good that's got to be yeah. good and i think I, I was saying to um sarah my my other half that um actually it's a good it's an essential thing because if young people didn't have a an increased awareness of this they really would be t driven to total insanity by social media yeah, and it's yeah. kind of it's almost maybe a a positive reaction from young people that they are understanding that they can't do this stuff all the time because it's not good for your health kind of thing yes yeah i agree so yeah there's a of course a shadow side to everything however um you know if social media has got a good th it's done a good thing it's to normalize some of this stuff annabelle please come in if you um yeah, so i'm interested got... Lou, you, you said the golden thread for you is is people and obviously you know, you've just described your time in management consulting as one of where you've, you know, been generous and worked with people and enjoyed working with people. But I was just wondering, was is there has there ever is that something that's just emerged, or was there a moment where you thought, I'm just really, I am, this is me, I am about people, uh, and if if it, you know, um, how did that come about? I think it's an ever evolving theme. If I'm honest you know the way if you look over your shoulder it's always easier to see the path that you've walked when you're walking it you don't necessarily take in all of the all of the landscape so I think it's always been there but I say that in retrospect my real recognition of it I would say has been in the last 10 years maybe even less than that and I'm still taking strides forward um, even today. You know, that's not that's not a static thing. It moves and changes shape and, you know, the ways that I can work with people and serve people, that's all new opportunities to do that are always opening up. Do you, do you think that there might be an insight there in that the answer to everything is always about people? Um, and I, I I say that as a as a sort of you know I'm a geek I I can I take a washing machine <laughs> apart I empathise with you know I, I I'm a bad programmer I understand things technically but as you unpick all of that the 
the only thing that ever makes anything in the world go round are the people and relationships and how how you manage that or yes. enable or facilitate. I I wonder whether this is a sort of a, a truth that we could do better in publicising and understanding more broadly that anything is always about people. Yes, I completely agree with you. And when you look at... Um, for example, a large corporate organisation, and you look at what they do with, well, that's a people-y thing, send that to HR. (laughs) Who, by the way, don't have a seat at the top table, do they? (laughs) No. They're normally off to one side. Oh, yes, send that over there. There's a slight dismissiveness about it. Our people are our greatest asset. Well, okay that's all that's true but then you've got the gap between what people say which is our people are our greatest asset and then what they do which is oh just go and see hr about that i can't be bothered and so i'm not obviously i'm exaggerating but not not everyone is like that but enough of it is there for people to feel stressed psychologically unsafe um, shut down, bullied, etc. You know, we all know that all these different, not great things that happen, and sometimes in very subtle ways in in organisations. And so, yes, I agree. Everything is about people. And I saw this brilliant um, TED talk years ago, and it really inspired me. This guy, um, I think he had a business in Brazil. I wish I could remember his name. Alas, I cannot. That he was delighted about the fact that he had an HR department with one person in it and that she was about to retire. And he had an enormous organization. But he's like, the, the responsibility, okay, yeah, he had a few people looking at legal things and making Contractual, sure. Contractual, yeah, <laughs> always. It always comes back to the legal HR. <laughs> You, you, that okay fine but actually beyond that the people the leaders and the managers in the organization were responsible for their their what so you couldn't say oh send that to hr because that they did there wasn't a big hr department that wasn't there mm-hmm. so you know i think there's some you know when we were talking earlier about bringing social value into the core you know marrying the two things up it's Really, the, I feel very strongly it's the same with people. It's over to one side. Let's bring it in and marry it up. Let's embed it. And there's so much great work going on with all of that. And it's come a huge, huge way. It really has. And I and think the thing, yeah, I, I think uh, uh, the disconnect that I think we have experienced in our conversations over the last 18 months or so is one of people not understanding that what you have just described there is actually a social value because it's looking after yeah. your people and looking after your community. And actually that's equally as valuable as anything you might be doing with disadvantaged children 300 miles away. You know, I mean, yes. everything's got its own you know, uh, weight of value, but but it's not insignificant that um, very... Well, it's, it's massive. You know, what what is the social value of meaningful employment and, and work uh, versus, you know, having a, a psycho boss that you want to kill um, who destroys yeah. your well-being? And, and, I, and I think that people find it quite... Di- yes, but is that real social value? It's like, well, sorry. Yes, it's the most important social value we could imagine a sort of meaningful productive engagement with work that's um it's, and to the extent you're enabling that or destroying it um, well yeah because you think about the, i think about over the years people who i've coached people who have had horrendous experiences at work because i specialize in kind of career workplace type of things and they are returning to work after a absolutely horrendous experience and they need some support. Where's that support coming from? It isn't coming from the organisation they're working for. It's which is probably allowed and to a degree enabled the bad behaviour. They're having to seek it out and pay for it themselves. And you know, so you just look at that and you think, hmm. <laughs> mm. So I think there's, you know, why do we need whistleblowing and things like that well because people don't feel fully safe to speak and that there won't be negative consequences from doing so Mm -hmm. you know so 
the, there's some really it's quite it gets quite deep actually when you start thinking about it and it and you can't necessarily overtly measure it and so sometimes people are like well where's my return on investment mm, okay that's possibly not the right question but um you still have to answer it because it's still important so you know my dream scenario would be there's no work for me to do <laughs> because <laughs> you know the the people are thriving so many in so many different ways and so many beautiful ways in their working life. No one needs any support. Mm. That wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah, because I often, yes. yeah, I, I often wish very putting it very simplistically. I wish rather than I wish we could just flip it and everybody just helped everybody. Even if it's not right for you, the environment that you're in, how do you help people move to somewhere that is rather than as soon as they, you know, go, this isn't right for me. We disregard them as an organisation. Yeah. You disregard them and go, well, that's your problem, not mine. Well, I just you know, imagine what it would be like if it was the other way around, you know, and we helped everybody be where they want to be. <laughs> it would be a great yeah. <laughs> well, it, would be. it would be what it would be. You know, there'd probably be things yeah. we hated about it, but, you know. Well, almost certainly. But, but you know, and I think it's really, you, it's tempting to go, oh, well, this is a macro problem. And, our, you know, little old me, I can't do anything. And I don't, and, and that's when the I comes back in, because actually, as an individual, if I choose to, I can choose to go, yeah, well, there's nothing I can do. Um because whatever that is what it is the culture is what it is i could do that or i could choose to show up in a way that did support the person who said well th listen this environment isn't for me and get them somewhere where they were better served and happier and thriving and so on i could also choose to do that even though the wider culture doesn't support it so so um without i try and keep it not incredibly um sort of deep dive, but there was this guy um, called Frederick Winslow Taylor, who invented this thing, which we now call Taylorism or scientific management, about how do we produce, you know, productive organisations. Um, and, and this idea, you know, what it spawned is the idea of this job role, this, this work role. Mm -hmm. And and so the conflicts that we're we're talking about here um, really do stem down to how humans actually interact with this piece of paper that says, "Well, my role is." Da, 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 da. And there's sort of the the idea that you know we're not real people. You know, we're just job descriptions that yeah. has inputs and outputs, and we screw lids on. Now, of course, AI is in the process of changing all of that. So as human being, you know, because we're going to displace workforces and that. But as, but as human beings, we have to deal with that conflict that actually Lou's not showing up because she's a mum, you know, she's it's the wrong, you know. And and it, if we just evaluate life through the job description or the role and go, well, Lou's not showed up, I'll just give that problem to HR to go, well, mm. non-attendance. So, and it, it's, a, it's a very difficult square to circle or circle to square or sort of thing to reconcile, isn't it? Because we've... We've had a couple of centuries of developing the machine of work, um, which is now going to be taken over by AI. But then mm -hmm. we need to sort of be very human centric. So we need to, to do what you were kind of doing in your management consultancy, which is, OK, I've got a number in my role, a target. But actually, you know, I'm finding that the more I help other people with their targets. Now, the role's not saying that. The social capital or social value is saying that. So... Mm. How do we, as human beings, kind of live this, this sort of these two lives here? That how do we how do we have the how do we judge the I versus the we or the the tail? You know, Taylorism mm. says do this. My instinct says do that. Um, can everybody be happy by you know we've got to do both? You know what what advice do you have having had a career in this? in this conflict um, you know? i i think that really it's comes down to two things knowing 
who you are as a person and therefore what's going to work for you. So you might be okay to work in a highly structured environment, which does require you to screw lids on and things like that. And you might be delighted with that because that might really work for you. Perfect. Um, and it might make you want to gouge your eyes out with a spoon, which in which case, <laughs> not perfect so you have to have a level of self-awareness you have to know what works for you and then i think that it come it does come down to choices yours you only you can only control your own choices um and so you know i i say this to people um that their thoughts and feelings um are theirs they they're not real they've created them for themselves and so if that's true then you could choose to create something else so but even then, if but, but but then so to challenge that you know yeah. you can you can pretend or make choices about screwing it you know but the more you understand who you actually are is I, I i i'm not i am a gouge the eyes out kind of person i'm not yeah. the lid you know we don't teach this in schools. We don't no. teach this in, you know, we've got the school of life, haven't we? It's like, well, I tried to screw the lids on. I ended up gouging my eyes out. And, you know, therefore I've kind of, I, I know a little bit reflectively because I had a nervous breakdown. I work for this yeah. person. And it's like, I'm exactly like, that. We, yeah. why, why? Sorry, Annabelle, go on. No, and then we view that as a failure, which it's not, of course. It's just part of the journey. <laughs> it's yeah, learning yeah. about ourselves. Um, but anyway, sorry. Well, I didn't have a fully formed question, but I've just felt moved to have a moan about the education system there. Ha yeah. Again, what, what can we do as we turn up every day um, to, to understand more of who we are, what we like, what we don't like, what we value, yeah. what we don't value? I personally think um that and funnily enough i was just having this conversation with paul this morning on my way back from the school run um <laughs> noticing is the thing noticing my resistance to screwing on those lids and then being curious okay so if i didn't screw on lids would i rather stick the labels on well i find the labels more interesting okay why well then you know Oh, well, actually, it's the artwork on the labels that I like. So what I'd really like to do is design the labels. OK, and now you're screwing on the lids. Which makes you want to gouge your eyes out with a spoon. So, OK, so first of all, don't do that. But then you can see, OK, that, 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 that. And then I'm designing the labels. And I might not be in the same place. I might be designing labels for someone else. The point being that journey begins with noticing your resistance or your discomfort or and you don't i think we want to then solve it okay so fine what do i do about it well it's not just notice that's it notice and be curious about why and that's a good place to start yeah and we we've experienced that over and over again in the years of running these pro uh, projects that where you give someone the space to notice and you don't put them in a, a a system of chaos where they have no cognitive surplus capacity to kind of notice um but very 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 quickly they can do more of this less of that and understand yeah. well <clears throat> i thought it was finance and then i gouged my eyes out i thought it was design and then i go i thought it was a, so so forgive give people whatever age the the capacity to experiment um, yes so, exactly. so shame, shameless uh, plug for the Commons Fund. You know that that's what we're doing. It, it's kind of like, particularly people outside the um, labour market who yes. maybe don't have the privilege of you know anything other than worrying about money. How yeah. how is it that they want to engage? Firstly, you've got to give them some headspace to go right. Okay, yes, I I now know that I can't really motivated to do that. Or I'm mm -hmm. really not motivated, but I, I think that was, um, yeah, no, it wasn't. It wasn't designed as a shameless plug, but it ended up. Uh, ended yeah, up but with you're you're quite right, and and I had a funny conversation with my son who's 13, and he said to me um, that somebody they were having a careers conversation at, at school, and that he's like, "Well, I don't know." <laughs> 
I'm 13. And I said, okay. And some people <laughs> might have an idea. They might think, oh, I really, but he said, it's funny. Mm -hmm. they, they might, they might, mm -hmm. and they might not. But there's this kind of, even at 13, this sort of assumption that one should really know or have an idea at least and he really loves cars and he said the thing is mum people are assuming because I love cars that I want to have a job with cars actually it's a hobby I really love it I don't I, I I can do lots of other things too let me just be okay with the breadth of it for now he didn't use those words but that's what he was <laughs> saying and people our need to put people in a little box a little diff, with a little label on it and what humans are doing is going, no, actually, I want to jump and be in five different boxes or and, and brilliant. And I think that's fantastic. So with technology, breaking things apart a bit. And I don't know a huge amount about AI other than it's here and it's going to have a, rip, a big ripple effect. Yeah. Um, but that, to your point, Rob, that might give people some headspace some opportunity to actually lean into something very different mm -hmm. that, yeah, that and I, I think for the future of work that's so important <laughs> because we actually don't know what sustainability looks like in a post ai world you know what what is it is it going to be permaculture is it going to be agriculture is it going to be technology yeah. or, how, how do we give people the space to invent that from a position outside of the system rather yes. than within a system that knows how to do Uber and Google, but actually it might not be a future full of Uber and Google. We haven't invented that yet. So who, who's going to invent that? Well, it's young people. It's people who are who don't actually have 27 years in one particular organisation. You know, yes. Designing six yeah. sticky tape or something. Yeah, exactly um, that. And, you know, we come then back to education and that Ken Robinson thing, you know, around creativity, um, there's this inherent maths and sciences are more important than art and dancing. Why? <laughs> They're not. Why? <laughs> They're not. Oh, no, absolutely not. Uh, but it's that 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 industrialization. No, I know. Of, I know. You know what I mean? You know, it's that. It's My that head same in every thing. Yeah. Yes, exactly that. And that what you were talking about, Rob, with that. Taylor, you know, that was it Taylor, the, the guy? Taylor, yeah, yeah, Taylorism. No, yeah. You end up with a job description. Well, do it in education, you end up with a curriculum of things that children should know. And I accept that we have to have a degree, some some of that. Yeah. Can they read? Can they write? Can they add up? <laughs> well, I was, I've was i been thinking a lot about this. I have a 15-year-old and I, I've got an older one who is, you know, just got on well with education and he's just different. Um, he's not, he's bright, he, but but just this whole academic thing is um, different to him. It's not, you know, it's not, mm. that's not how he's going to find himself, you know, he's not at all. I mean, not that many people necessarily do, but it's just but bought of me to have a very critical eye on education, you know, and, and mm. just the whole cramming it all to into, you know, up until you're 18 and shouldn't it be lifelong and shouldn't it be about continual enrichment and shouldn't it be about enjoying things, you know, what, what, why, because I'm not doing history GCSE, does that mean I never study history ever again? I'm like, well, that's mental, you know, I think it's just yeah. for the subjects because they have a huge importance in society and who we are culturally and all, all everything that you can get from these, particularly the social subjects and then you know the importance of science and the importance of creativity in science and you know uh, you know I mean yeah I could go on forever it just like a constant like what should this look like next you know where are we going with this and like the 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 world that I could imagine on, on my wildest dreams day looks nothing like where we are now for education at all uh very very different um and but I think the same are, is going to be true of place. Yeah, Sorry? we are where we are. But we're not. In, we're not static in either of those fields, are we? Mm. We're moving all the time at quite rapid, you know, quite a rapid pace. And I think, um, you know, often it's about surviving education, not coming out completely destroyed by it. I'm it's, very conscious of the time we have been. Mm. Uh, Fifty-five minutes in, I, I, I would can can I just 
take us full circle and back to doing well, doing good, and just talk mm. about what what you're doing now, where you're going next, and um, sort of reciprocity was the word that I keep remembering every time I look at mm. doing well, doing good, um, and having been personally quite not reciprocity but moved by generosity out of John I don't know whether you know John Stepper working out loud whether you're familiar with his work but no. one of the pins of that working out loud is generosity which is about giving to people because in the end you'll get things come back when you do um but yes anyway so yeah where where next well, we, with you and what you're doing where next I mean what we are we are always looking for um opportunities to connect and i mean that's how we all met um yeah. and it's i love working in this space because it's there are so many incredible people doing so many great things and it's it's hugely encouraging and it's full of hope and full of you know innovation and you know, breaking apart some of these things that don't work anymore and seeing how they can work better. So we're all about growth, actually, you know, for organisations because, and that doesn't just mean businesses, because we work with all sorts of different organisations. But to your earlier point, Rob, it's all about the people, really. So how can we get in there and help you to do well and do good. So everything we do has both components side by side, both sides of the coin. And as a club, um, we do things, we have like a reciprocity cafe, which is an online space where somebody from the community will come and offer something, for, you know, and you might have to, you know, I don't know, to cover our costs, you might have to buy a virtual latte bless you um and <laughs> but but the reciprocity cafe is just a community event so we like to run events where people can engage get to know each other. bless you again and um we also then do projects to help different organizations in different ways do well and do good um so would so it would it feel as a customer would it feel like a membership club or a consulting engagement or you know how how would you characterize the you know because you use the word club quite a bit yes yeah. so you can join the club you can be in the club as it very much were i could sing at this point but i'm not going to and um oh go on <laughs> no. no i just couldn't possibly uh, <laughs> i'm feeling you carry it a membership here <laughs> I know. Oh. After a few wines, oh my goodness, can you imagine? Um, so yes, Rob, it is a membership thing. You can be part of the club, which enables you then. So what we do is we we understand you and you in the context of where you work and. Uh, you know, you might say, I'm really involved in a, this sports charity and I'm really involved in this and this is very meaningful to me. And then as we then facilitate really mean, what we think will be really meaningful introductions for you to other people in the community so that you can get more of the things that, that you know, you and we are, are looking for. So, again, it's doing well and doing good. Um, and that's the and then there are events and other things that happen within the the club. If you came to us with a specific problem and you said, um, "Oh my goodness, um, that we've got this really tricky issue," what we do, um, I don't know. Let's take an example. Um, you might say um, we uh, our leadership are you know we've got we've got an issue with our leadership and we might say right okay so we would assemble a collaborative team so that would might be me and Paul and Dan it might be other people who come together so we together collectively because no one's got all of the answers we draw different experience expertise perspectives 
and look at this problem. And that is more of a, you know, what you might call in inverted commas, a consulting type engagement. But again, it's doing well and doing good both. Yeah, very interesting. Is it <clears throat> something that struck us in, in building out the Commons Fund is that we're connected to so many networks. And rather than thinking of I, as in what is the Commons Fund and how would we engage with that? If you look at all of the networks and what does yeah. this network want? What does that work? What is it? You know, I, I think that the emerging partnership with doing well, doing good is is quite interesting in terms of linking those network, linking your network with these others. Yes. For example, and the and the other way around, linking those other yeah. networks to to what you're doing, because every everyone's doing something slightly different, but yeah. there's in common are the people and the sort of challenges that that these networks have. Yes. Um, so I think that's an interesting approach. Yeah, I agree. And we always talk about the network of networks because, you know, and you twang the network in one place and it has this impact. Hmm. So, yeah, it's very powerful stuff. Good. Excellent. Okay. Well, we are an hour and nearly two minutes in. So um, I would suggesting, I am suggesting, not would suggesting, uh, that we um, uh, that we draw stumps now um, and say thank you very much for joining us, Lou. That was wonderful. I hope that was enjoyable for you. Very, thank you very much. <laughs> I feel okay, like until the next time. Anyway, until the next time. Thank you very Bye. much. Thank you, Lou.